look at these owls. Two of these owls are the same species. Can you tell me which two are the same and which is different? It's okay if you're having trouble. All three of these owls look strikingly similar, and it's hard to tell which species is which based on appearance alone. So first, it might be helpful to ask, what exactly is a species? Well, for many people, including Carl Linnaeus, the guy that invented taxonomy, a species is just an organism that can be distinguished from another. Well, that's great if you're trying to tell a lion apart from a tiger, but that doesn't really help us with these owls. Besides, that Linnaeus guy lived like 400 years ago. There has to be a more modern, accurate definition to tell us what a species is. So let's check the literature. Wait. Okay, so the literature must be broken, because there has to be a general consensus as to what a species is by now, right? Well, it turns out that in the centuries since the term species was coined, biologists still haven't come up with a consistent definition for the term species. This topic has been hotly debated in the biology world for decades, with some 20 plus species concepts being employed in this duration. But the problem is yet to be solved. There is still no general consensus as to how to define a species. Or is there? If you check any modern biology textbook, you will likely find something called the biological species concept. This bad boy was the brainchild of superbiologist Ernst Meyer, who set out to solve the species problem for good with this species concept. It states that a species is a population whose members are able to interbreed freely under natural conditions. Well, let's apply that to these owls. Okay, so these two live here, and this one lives here. By Jove, we've done it! Ernst, you decadent scoundrel, you! You see, this third owl doesn't live in the same range as the other two, so it won't ever have the opportunity to mate with them in the wild, making it reproductively isolated, and therefore a different species. By using the biological species concept, which focuses on reproductive isolation, we were able to delimitate which species is which. So this is it, right? Case closed. We have the best definition for a species right here. I mean, it's the most commonly accepted species concept, and it's usually the version included in textbooks. And it worked with the owls. Surely this is the one species concept to rule them all, right? Right, Ernst? Well, while this concept works for most living sexual organisms, it is by no means all-inclusive. Calling two organisms a species just because they can reproduce with each other doesn't always work. You see, the natural world is incredibly diverse, and it is constantly changing. Also, there are various modes of reproduction, and the biological species concept only applies to sexual organisms. But not all creatures have sex. We're one of the lucky ones. Some organisms are asexual, reproducing without sex. This is usually accomplished by means of binary fission, budding, or fragmentation. Some are hermaphrodites, meaning they have both male and female sex organs. Organisms like this clownfish are called sequential hermaphrodites because they can change their sex at some point in their life. But when an organism possesses fully functional male and female sex organs at the same time, it is called a simultaneous hermaphrodite. A lot of plants are simultaneous hermaphrodites, but they can go f*** themselves. Some organisms don't even have to be f*** to reproduce. Parthenogenesis is a process whereby organisms are born from unfertilized eggs. Organisms with this mode of reproduction can reproduce both asexually and sexually, depending on what kind of mood they're in. Then, of course, we have the organisms that are so tiny that we can't even observe their reproduction. Bacteria and protists are notoriously difficult to classify because they are just so small. And as you might imagine, throwing extinct species into the mix just makes a mess of things entirely. This is where the biological species concept starts to fall apart. So, okay, you get it. The biological species concept, despite being the concept included in most textbooks, is riddled with inconsistencies and ambiguities. So, after realizing this, biologists set out to find a new, improved species concept that will blow old Ernsty boy out of the water. The result was the phylogenetic species concept. The phylogenetic species concept is perhaps the biggest contender to the biological species concept in terms of popularity, as it is not constrained by interbreeding. It focuses on an organism's evolutionary history, taking into account shared characteristics. 
So with this concept, in order to be considered a species, the organism has to be diagnosably different than other organisms. But they also have to have shared ancestry. The species concept no, is the stuff God. of nightmares if your name is Ernst Meyer, because it can be applied to fossils, bacteria, and asexual organisms. It's basically the Chad species concept. But while it may solve many of the problems we faced with the biological species concept, it's still not universally accepted. The biggest beef most biologists have with the phylogenetic species concept is that it is very vague concerning just exactly how diagnosably different the organisms need to be from each other in order to be considered a different species. Look, life is incredibly diverse. I cannot stress this enough. And any group of organisms, no matter how related, is going to have at least some variation, even if it be the slightest difference. But the slighter the difference used when classifying under the species concept, the more total number of species there will be. And that's a problem, because biologists using the species concept tend to overclassify, resulting in inconsistencies in the total number of recognized species. Scientists have estimated that there are around 8.7 million species of plants and animals in existence. But if we reclassified every one of those using the phylogenetic species concept, we would have a higher number of total recognized species. And that's confusing. So biologists came up with another species concept. And another. And another. And another. And another. And another. And another. So that's how we got here. Each new species concept generally attempts to solve a previous inconsistency from a former concept. But by doing so, it will inevitably open up its own new can of worms. So by now you might be starting to realize that it's not as easy as it looks to classify an organism. But to be fair, it's not always easy to classify something that constantly changes. I mean, organisms undergo a process called evolution. They're constantly evolving. Where does one species end and another begin in the natural world? With the biological species concept, two reproductively isolated populations of the same type of organism can be called a different species. For instance, the eastern and western bluebird look nearly identical and might even be capable of interbreeding, except for the fact that they are geographically isolated. If it weren't for this gap in their ranges, they might indeed be classified as the same species. Similarly, populations of the same species that have become geographically separated will undergo evolution at varying rates, eventually diverging from each other to form two new species in a process called speciation. Speciation involves the formation of a new species by splitting a single lineage into two or more reproductively isolated ones. It is important to remember that speciation is a long and complex process that can happen in a variety of ways. During the speciation process, gradual changes occur to the diverging lineages over generations that eventually will lead to the two lineages becoming so distinct that they will no longer be able to reproduce successfully. But during this gradual transition, the branching lineages will still be able to interbreed. This stage is often referred to as an intermediate species. So, is an intermediate species a different species from the original? Where exactly do we draw the line between two different species? Because of the various ways of forming a new species, and the difficulties imposed by intermediate species, it is understandable that a variety of species concepts have been employed. But should they have been? I mean, do species even really exist? These aren't atoms we're dealing with here. They're not fixed, constant properties. No two organisms are the same, and species are constantly evolving. Add to that the fact that we're dealing with living, breathing organisms, and this can quickly devolve into a philosophic debate. While some biologists might argue differently, the species is really just a human construct. Many biologists consider the species to be a fundamental unit of biology, comparable to genes and cells. Atoms organize into molecules, which then assemble into proteins and organelles, which build up the cell. Cells aggregate to form tissues, which form organs that, when assembled correctly, form a multicellular organism. We humans love this. The fact that you can take a complex, multicellular organism and break it down into smaller building blocks or units, which serve a specific function and can in turn be broken down into smaller and smaller functional units. We love this because these functional units help us analyze complex holes in smaller pieces. 
but a functional unit needs to be constant for it to effectively aid in analyzing the whole. So is there really evidence that a species is a fundamental unit in biology? Well, let's take a look at the cell. It's the fundamental unit of the organism. It has a strict criteria for what is and what isn't a cell, and it works for every type of cell. The same goes with the atom. There are different types of atoms, but they all share the same fundamental properties. Now, let's look back at the species. It is not well-defined, and there is no strict criteria. So, why are we treating the species as a fundamental unit when it doesn't act like any other fundamental unit in science? Well, that's because the species, when first constructed as a concept, was simply the lowest level of classification on our taxonomical hierarchy. Taxonomy is a hierarchical classification system invented in the 1700s. The highest rank is very broad, and each subsequent rank gets more and more refined until you get to the species level. The species wasn't originally intended to be a fundamental unit of biodiversity. But somewhere along the way, the term species went from simply being a unit of classification on a scale that we invented to a universal fundamental unit of nature. But Linnaeus didn't know about evolution and the constant change of organisms when he invented this classification system. Additionally, the Linnaean classification system is hundreds of years old. We didn't know then what we know now, or maybe we would have picked a different system. But this is the one that caught on, and we've stuck with it. So is it really that surprising that we're having difficulties making a 300-year-old system fit around the knowledge we have of the natural world today? Now, there are some mad lad biologists out there that believe in a unified species concept. But what if there is no true definition for what a species is? And why does there even have to be a single unified concept in the first place? What if we just keep all of our current concepts and employ them for different situations? This is referred to as pluralism, and it has its own dedicated following, as is the case with almost every species concept in existence. Regardless, thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Let me know in the comments what you thought, and please subscribe.